Well, we touched on this before. Another development of Labor's campaign launch on the weekend was the former Prime Minister Paul Keating's rebuke of Australia's security agencies for the stance they have taken on China. What when the this, security the agencies are running are. foreign policy, the nutters are in charge. You know, the nutters are in charge. The security of the agencies that would be advising Labor. Oh yeah, well you clean them out. You clean them out. I mean, once that Ghana guy come back from China, and and Turnbull gave him the uh, the ticket to go and hop into the security agencies, they've all gone burko ever since. You know, when you've got the ASIO chief knocking on MPs' doors. You know something's wrong. China is a great state. It's always been a great state and now has the second largest economy, soon the largest economy in the world. If we have a foreign policy that does not take that into account, we are fools. Our security agencies have prevented 15 terrorist attacks in Australia. And so for what the Labor Party calls a Labor legend to go out there and attack the credibility of our security agencies, that have been saving lives in this country, I think is very disappointing. Well, Labor today distanced itself from the remarks with Bill Shorten saying he disagrees with Mr Keating's assertions. For more on this, we're joined from Canberra by the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, Professor John Blacksland. Professor, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me on the show, Catherine. Does Paul Keating have a point? Have our security agencies lost their bearings? Uh, look, one of the things we can really thank Paul Keating for is raising the issue of intelligence and security. He has a long tradition of being the human headline, if you like, from uh, souffles to banana republics to <laughs> scumbags and now nutters. Uh, so, you know, it's great the way he's actually brought it front and centre to our discussion here on the drum tonight even. Um, but the term itself, nutters, I think is a little bit overblown. Uh, in fact, really it's almost Trumpian uh, uh, in, in terms of over-dramatising the effect. The thing is that what we've got at the moment is a situation where what's told inside the, you know, hushed, uh, huddled corners of the security space in Canberra is actually not quite the story we're hearing out in the public, although it's starting to get out there. And what we've seen is that uh, people who have not been exposed to the sensitive source material that the intelligence community tends to uh, share with those who are, have got special privilege access, such as ministers and senior appointments of government, is that there really is a growing concern about security challenges writ large, and China is part of that mix. In fact, it's great that Paul has mentioned, you know, the elephant in the room, or dare I say the dragon in the room, because China is really a fundamental question we need to grapple with. But to describe the security agency heads as nutters is uh, unfair and unreasonable. Uh, the bottom line is these people are privy to information that when you, when you think about it, it's actually pretty stark, pretty dark, pretty sobering uh, and pretty challenging. And that means that when they brief people, and this is something that happened to Malcolm Turnbull, before he was Prime Minister, he was... Uh, quite strong on, uh, you know, on pro, being pro-China and building ties. And then when he got briefed in, his tone changed dramatically. Why? Because he got access to the privileged information about foreign interference, about the scale of the security challenge inside and outside Australia, about the scale of China's actions inside Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and the threat that this poses to Australia's interests. And that's, I think, where I think Paul might have it a little bit wrong. So, John, what do you think the motivations were behind these comments? Uh, look, uh, you know, I think there's really some concerns about the way the Home Affairs Department has emerged, and I've been critical of that in the past myself. It emerged at the time of the Independent Intelligence Review in 2017, which articulated a very compelling case for some reform inside the intelligence community for an expansion of the remit of the Office of National Intelligence mm -hmm. to cover that policing security intelligence space that had been a little bit of a, a twilight zone before. That's now very categorically clearly within the mandate of the oversight architecture of the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, 
the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the National Security of Cabinet. These are very important instrumentalities for governance, for control, for direction and accountability. Now, they, they weren't there before, um, and they, they're the product of considerable reform over a number of decades, going back to the 70s, 80s and 90s, with Justice Robert Marsden Hope, confirmed after the Iraq War, follow the, following the re, uh, review by Philip Flood, uh, and then confirmed in 2017 by the review undertaken by Steve Merchant and Michael Lestrange. The, there's a whole series of mechanisms that have led to this fairly robust architecture, but what's added a bit of kind of muddying of the waters is this creation of the home affairs construct on top of that. So some of those agencies that were falling under the Office of National Intelligence under the review of 2017 are now headed by Mike Pizzullo and uh, Peter Dutton in the home affairs construct. And that's where the rub point is, I think. And that's where I think there's scope for some uh, review, some revisiting of the arrangements once the elections are concluded. So, Professor Blackson, before I open uh, this discussion up to the panel, mm. should we be taking a softer approach to China? There's no question we have to walk very, very carefully. Our line between the economic aspect of our relationship and the security aspect of our relationship, uh, there's a creative tension we need to maintain. It's a challenge for our politicians to ma master that, that creative tension, if you like, because economically, clearly, our ties with China are significant, but they're not exclusive. I mean, we have ties with others, with India, with Southeast Asia, a, a region that we've disaggregated in our consciousness. That is actually, when you aggregate Southeast Asia, is up there with India and Japan in terms of consequence, but also the United States. That is actually, in terms of foreign direct investment, uh, the greatest investor still by a long shot inside Australia. So there's a whole range of things we need to balance. Then, of course, there's the question of Japan. Japan's got a big stake in this as well. They're very keenly engaging with Australia because they're trying to balance a bit of China as well. So when we talk about China, it's not just China. It's China in the mix of a spectrum of factors. And that's why it's so interesting to see this now come out in the debate. I'm hoping that there'll be more of it because it really is very important to our future. And it's not black and it's not white. And there's a lot of grey in between. Mm. And we've got to work it out. Uh, Catherine Griner, do you think our security agencies play uh, too big a part in formulating foreign policy? Well, I was in, uh, really interested in what John had to say. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole issue about China and John's point is so valid that we have to, to tread very carefully. You have to remember that China is hugely influential right throughout the South Pacific region, mm. um, particularly in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, which takes it out to the western part of mm. China. I was actually in Kashgar last year, the very western part of China where the Arumkis are, um, who are disappearing into their re-education camps at a great rate. Um, there, is, there is a whole a lot of control mechanisms coming back into play domestically in China, but their external relations are one of um, influence and peddling very strong influence to some of the, the communities and the countries to our near north. Um, and John's far more expert at this than I, but I think we've got we've got to take this very carefully. And I was, I think, a little bit surprised by Keating's comments that um, the, he understands, Keating understands very clearly that this is an area about which we have to tread very warily and very carefully. I was just wondering whether it was a bit of relevance deprivation. That's very harsh. Well, Pete, so <laughs> if, 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 is it likely that these comments are going to make it harder for Labor in its policy, given the government now is opening to shift the debate to national security, which is generally their turf, not necessarily Labor's? I think with FAO, if you talk about the pop population, what you said about when they're brushing their teeth in the morning, they're not necessarily thinking about tax. In terms of the election and the electorate, mm. um, I don't think that the foreign policy is top of mind or even close. Could I ask Professor Blacksland a yes. question? Professor, I'm interested in... Uh, with the American policy, for, for many years our policy is basically foreign policy, hasn't been far off, we'll have fries with that, we'll do what America does. <laughs> I mean, very, very broadly, all the way with LBJ, various versions of that. Is there, a, in terms of dealing with China, are our interests quite clearly distinct from America's interest in the way that we, with the, we, we face China? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And uh, look, there's a colleague, Shannon Toe, wrote a book called Independent Ally. He's a colleague 
at the Strategic and Defence Study Centre. She published with us a book that really speaks to Australia's foreign policy being driven by Australia's national interests. Uh, and so, you know, what we often hear is the rhetorical line of, oh, Australia being the, you know, the, the deputy sheriff, we're just kowtowing to America. What we find, though, is quite often there's a confluence of interests. Australian interests often overlap with American interests. And when that does, Australia acts in a way that sees us looking like, to a certain extent, maybe to some, as a bit of a patsy. But there's a really interesting point I'd like to make here about the significance of Australia's actions, which I really do see as in independent, but informed by the significance of the alliance ties with the United States. So there's a significant distinction to make there. And that is that essentially when we look at our neighbourhood, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines and others, they look at us to see how we engage with the United States and how we engage with China. So we're a bit of a, we're kind of a, 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 an exemplar for the neighbourhood. They want to see what we're doing. They will never declare this publicly, of course, but in private they'll often say, you know, we're quite interested in what you're doing and we'll never quite match you in terms of being outspoken or up, up front about a certain issue. But we're quite happy about where you're going because it gives us strategic breathing space to act just short of that in a way that's not confrontational to China. Uh, and I think that's a very important point when we think about Australia's interests. Uh, and as we engage with our neighbourhood, it's very important for us to engage particularly with Southeast Asia and the Pacific because they're our immediate neighbours. They're looking to us, even though they'll never admit it publicly, they're looking to us to see what are we doing? We're kind of the litmus test in the neighbourhood. And John, if I can, we can just round out this conversation very briefly on uh, prime ministerial relationships with China. Malcolm mm. Turnbull was criticised for being responsible for that relationship turning into a frosty one. Mm. Who is better placed? Is it Scott Morrison or Bill Shorten uh, for, to, to foster relations with China in a way that is prosperous for Australia? Look, I think there's arguably room for a fresh start. And I think uh, the team uh, with Penny Wong and Richard Miles is a very strong one. Uh, and they have articulated very compelling, balanced perspectives on what Australia's options are for engagement, particularly in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia and beyond. They're level-headed about the alliance. So uh, while the Liberals might want to uh, you know, claim that they've got the, the, uh, the stronger credentials on national security, uh, I think uh, uh, it's a line ball call, uh, and I uh, I just think uh, it would be dangerous, it would be inappropriate to label the Labor Party's position as foolhardy. They're, they're clearly not. Tanya Plibersek have, has come out uh, very clearly, uh, as has uh, mm. Bill Shorten recently. Their positions are quite reasonable, and they have Australia's national interests in mind. To be fair, I think both sides of politics do that, um, and uh, so. Uh, you know, I'm relatively sanguine about the options. OK, John Blackson, we are out of time, but great to get your insight. Thank you very much. John Blackson, Head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the ANU.